Well, good evening, everyone, and praise the Lord to you. We are so excited that you found us here on YouTube for our weekly Bible study lesson. I'm Dr. Bernetta, and on behalf of Apostle Henry and Bishop Marty Alexander, we're so thrilled to be able to bring this empowering lesson just for you. You should have already received tonight's notes in your email, but if you're new around here, don't worry. We have notes for you. You can go to our website at myshieldoffaith.com and just click on Bible studies and the notes should be right there for you. Or you can reach out to us at 909-629-6294 and we will be happy to connect with you and make sure that you can get each week's notes. All right, settle back and get ready to receive a wonderful word from God. We know it's going to be a blessing to you and your life. I'll see you at the end. First of all, everybody, uh, and uh, things are just a little bit different on today. You'll see that we have a different a backdrop because we have some things that are going on at our home, good things, uh, but it just creates a, just a bit of dislocation for tonight. Well, God bless all of you. We welcome you this evening. We're still, what, about four or five minutes before Bible study. This is a time that we are asking you to uh, do your contacts. Would you please reach out to your loved ones? And would you uh, make an effort to uh, connect them, to share, uh, and so that many people can hear this word of the Lord. We're going to have a great Bible study tonight. It's going to be wonderful. And so uh, let's get ready. Your notes have been provided to you. Thank you, Minister Simeon McGee, for putting the notes where all of the saints can get them. And you have a beautiful set of uh, notes on tonight, three pages that we're going to be talking about on this evening. Well, we're very happy in the Lord. We're glad to be with you. Grateful for each one of you that loves the Lord enough to, to be on. So please use these minutes to get ready, get your Bible, get your notes and um, get your friends uh, connected to this study on tonight. Our numbers on Tuesday night are very, very good. We thank the Lord for that. Your sharing is an important part of that. And even after we finish teaching, you can continue to share the lesson afterward because it is archived and others can come along and receive the blessing. What God's going to say to us on tonight. All right. Uh, so Bishop Marty, uh, I think we're almost ready. We don't want to start too soon. We always want to come on about five minutes early and give everybody a chance to kind of settle in. Then we begin right at, uh, at the hour. All right. Um, but let's begin. Let's go ahead and begin with prayer. We do want to thank the Lord for the prayer that has already gone forward. And you all remember that we're together in prayer for 30 minutes on Tuesday night. And God certainly honors it. And thank you for being part of that. Mr. Martin, would you begin opening prayer for this Bible study on right now? Father God, in the name of Jesus, we take this moment to acknowledge you. Lord, we don't want to assume anything, and we certainly don't want to jump ahead of your will. So therefore, we stop, Lord, to acknowledge you and to ask that your will will be done in this lesson on tonight. Lord, as we open your word, as we study, Lord God, it is our intention to lend our ear toward you yes, to hear what you're saying. Lord, we want to be in a place of blessing. We want you to bless us, and we in turn want to praise and honor you. We thank you for all of our viewership. Lord God, we thank you for each one. We ask you, Lord God, to be blessed uh, by our uh, attention to yes, your yes, word. Yes. And Lord, we don't want to just be... Uh, a reader yes. of your word, but we want to be a doer of yes, your word, yes, yes. and therefore we thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Thank Amen. you for that beautiful prayer. All right, get your notes. Please get your notes. Uh, now let me give announcements before we begin, give you just a little bit more time to gather. Uh, I'm going to make some announcements now. This Saturday, we have a fine arts gathering for those of you that want to feed your intellect. We're going to go to the Claremont colleges and uh, see a widow's tale by William Shakespeare. So uh, we can't accuse each other of being ignorant and unlearned. We are people that have good minds and we are feeding our intellect as we should. God honors that. So that's this Saturday night. 
So uh, see us, call the office if you'd like to go. We'd love to have you. I'm excited about going. I also want to announce that the day of giving is coming up. The day of giving, the day of giving. We're excited about that. We do it twice every year. We know how to do it. And I want to thank you for consistent uh, support in this. I want to thank you because you've shown yourself willing to uh, resource the kingdom of God by your special being. So uh, it's about, what, three weeks away. Uh, three more Sundays will be the first Sunday in August. That'll be our day of giving. That's when we bring special money for the house of the Lord. Things are going well. We're moving forward with our building. But this is a very wonderful time to focus on giving. The third announcement, this Sunday we're going to have Bishop Anthony Hall from uh, Kannapolis, from Charlotte, North Carolina. He and his wife are going to be with us. He's going to be our guest preacher. He's one of my favorite preachers. And you're going to be blessed on Sunday. So everybody be present. We need more attendance than ever so that we can be blessed by the word of the Lord. Those are our announcements. Is there any other before we start on this? There is a leaders meeting on Saturday. Get leaders gathering, we call it, because we gather together as spiritual friends. We come together and we study what we're doing for the Lord. We coordinate our efforts. And that's going to take us right into our lesson for tonight, Dr. Martin. All right. What is the title of our lesson for tonight, woman of God? Reaching the world by growing the church. All right. Reaching the world by doing what? Growing. By growing. So as we grow God's church... Yeah. We are rescuing souls from hell. Yes. We're changing people's eternal destiny. The lesson that we're going to give tonight, it comes in several parts. First of all, there's an introduction, saints. Then we're going to talk about church growth in the book of Acts. We're going to look back and see how things happen in the book of Acts. Then we're going to talk about the ingredients for church growth. How does the church grow? Then we're going to talk about what spiritual unity looks like. What does it mean to be on one accord? And then finally, we're going to talk about what's in it for me. We want you to know what benefit that you get as a child of God from working with the Lord, laboring with the Lord to grow uh, the church. All right, so that's our study on tonight. And so we're going to dive in. Bishop Marty, would you read the three primary scriptures? And I want to say to each of you, uh, please chat together one with another. Please uh, put in your hearts and your likes and your thumbs up and whatever you can do to be interactive as we prepare ourselves to please Jesus by going in his church. Would you give us our three scriptures on tonight, Mother God? Yes. The first scripture is found in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. And it says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. All right, that's scripture number one. What is our second scripture tonight? Acts chapter 6 and verse 7. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. Mm -hmm. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. All right, that's number two. What is our third scripture, please? Acts 19 and 20. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. So I hope you have these notes, but if you don't have them, we'll remind you again. Acts 2.47, Acts 6 and 7, and Acts 19 and 20. We're talking about winning the world by growing the church. Now we should grow God's church. We make no apology for seeking to grow the church. It is not vanity. It is not in our own selfish best interest. It is the heart of God. God would have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants every individual in Rancho Cucamonga saved. Yes. And so the way he does that is by growing his body, which is the church. All right? Scripture says in Colossians chapter 1 that he's the head of the, of the body, which is the church. All right? And so the Lord wants to grow the church. So Bishop Marty wants to grow the church. And I want to grow the church, but we don't want to do it for selfish reasons. We want to grow the church because God said, upon this rock, I will build, I will grow my church. Yes. And the gates of hell are going to try to stop the church from growing, but the gates of hell will never succeed. So we then are going to reach the world and populate heaven 
by growing the church. So this lesson tonight is designed to inspire you to get busy working with God to grow his church. None of the churches have been through a very difficult time. For the last couple of years, there's been sickness, there have been all kinds of dislocations, and one crisis after another. And the enemy has sought to use all of them to weaken the church rather than see the churches grow. So tonight, we're talking about what God wants to do. He wants to grow His church, and He's going to do that. Now, Bishop Marty, the three scriptures that, uh, that you read for us... Um, what, what can we expect, the late, what can we expect out of those three scriptures being put together? Acts 2 and 47. Mm -hmm. First of all, it says they were praising God. Mm -hmm. You've got to praise God, mm -hmm. and that's a part of growing the church. Mm -hmm. It says, and the Lord added. And the key word there is added. Added. All right. All right. Then what about the next verse? What do you see? And Acts 6 and 7, and the word of God increased. It was mm -hmm. going far and mm -hmm. wide. Mm -hmm. And it says, and the number of the disciples multiplied. All right, so now we see that. We see, first of all, the church was adding. And then the church began multiplying. Mm -hmm. And then what happened after that in the third verse? So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. So that's what we're wanting to show you. And putting those, those three scriptures together. First of all, the church grew by addition. Then it grew by multiplication. Then it grew by dominance and conquest yes. and prevalence. And so the church of God in the book of Acts, it was not a few people sitting around discouraged, hanging on, wishing Jesus would come back tomorrow. They were dynamically moving forward. That's what we're talking about tonight, precious saints of God. Dynamically moving forward. So the Lord was adding day by day in the first chapter of the church. So the church begins in Acts chapter 2. And then in Acts chapter 6, when they organized the church and put deacons in place, mm -hmm. then the church began to multiply. It went from addition. Now, how many know that multiplication is better than addition? Amen. See, if somebody gives you $2 and two more, that's all right. If somebody gives you $2 and then multiplies it by six, you got 12. So multiplication is greater than addition. Mm -hmm. You don't get very far adding, but you get a whole lot farther when you do exponential multiplication. So in Acts chapter 2, the church was adding. In chapter 6, the church was multiplying. And a great number of the priests became believers. And then in Acts chapter 19, at Ephesus, when Paul found those 12 men and asked them, have you all received the Holy Ghost? Paul stayed there for two full years and said that the word grew and the church prevailed. What does that mean? It means it blew up. It exploded in growth. Now listen to that. Addition, multiplication, explosion. All right. In, in any project, Bishop Marty, there can be something called a tipping point. That's when all the stars align and all of a sudden everything is right and your organization explodes in growth. All right. Tesla did that. Apple did that. Um, um, Jeff Bezos, what is this company? Amazon. Amazon. They did that. The, you get to a tipping point where everything is right. And you just have explosive... Now listen, I'm very spiritual in saying these things. So that's what happened with the church. It started small, you have Pentecost, 120. Then another 3,000 in chapter 2. Then another 5,000 in chapter 4. And then they began to multiply in chapter 6. And then they exploded and took over in chapter 19. So that, saints of God, the church conquered the Roman Empire. We're going to see that in our lesson tonight. And Rome went away in 476. Rome fell. The city of Rome fell. And the church went right on, straight through the Middle Ages, all the way up to 1500s, 1600s. The church was there. So the church grew. What are you saying, Apostle? What are you saying, Mr. Martin? We're saying that the Lord wants to grow His church. None of this COVID thinking. You know, us four no more. Well, this is a few of us left, and we're going to just hold on. No, no, no. That's the life of the devil. That's not what Jesus is about at all. And this lesson that we're giving you tonight is about helping all of us to get in that growth mindset, that growth mentality. You'll get what you believe God for. You'll get what you're aiming at. You'll get what you think you can get. You'll accomplish what you're confident 
And so tonight we're going to stir ourselves up, Bishop Mark. So would you read that first uh, introductory paragraph and ex expound on it, please? Jesus has always been passionate about growing his church. Mm -hmm. From the moment Jesus selected his disciples, the objective has been to see the church grow. grow. Right. To call more and more people into the kingdom of God by bringing them to salvation. Jesus spoke of building his church and his objectives have always been global and local. God must simultaneously build the church in Rancho Cucamonga and also in Chile, Tanzania, Botswana, France, Yemen, and all over the world. The church began with just 120 people in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. but it quickly spread to all Judea, Samaria, and to the farthest reaches of the earth, including California. Mm -hmm. Our ministry impacts many continents and nations worldwide. But our primary responsibility is to see more people coming to worship each Sunday in Rancho Cucamonga and to continue baptizing souls in the name of Jesus and seeing them filled with the precious Holy Ghost. With the precious Holy Ghost. All God's people are obligated to accept both a local and global responsibility for the growth of the kingdom. We are eternally wise when we do everything we possibly can to see God's church grow both at home and abroad. Well, we can see from this, what I've just read, that, that the Lord wants people to be saved. Yes. That, that's, what his, that's what this is all about. Yes, yes, yes. And it's so vitally important that wherever you live, that's where your mission field is. And... Um, we've been all over the world. We've been to Africa, Europe, Canada, Mexico, the Gian Islands. We've, we've been to so many places preaching uh, Acts 2 and 38, the infilling of the Holy Ghost, preaching mm -hmm. healing, preaching deliverance, preaching the promises of God. He wants to grow his church. So we have to do everything that we can, mm -hmm. and that's what this lesson is about tonight. To look into the word to find out how will God's church grow? What can we do? What can we do to fulfill the divine commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? So we're not alone in, in Rancho Cucamonga. Oh, we're not alone. No. No. We're part of a global enterprise. We're part of a 2,000 year old continuous enterprise begun by the Holy Spirit and still going on. And it isn't just us. It isn't just us who meet at what is 95, 92, 7th Street. Right. But there are lots of other churches in Rancho Cucamonga. Lots. All over uh, Inland Empire. All over California. All over the United States and all the way around the world. And we must think about the church growing. Now that's one reason why, Bishop Marty, you have flown 20 hours. 10 hours to Europe, another 10 hours down to Africa to go and meet with people because you know that God's so many enterprise is a worldwide thing. So we cannot get narrow-minded. We cannot just get tunnel vision about what God is doing or not doing in our own. Because even if for a moment, if our church wasn't growing and we are baptized, and we expect to baptize two more on Sunday, our numbers are growing and the attendance is growing on Sunday morning, which we thank God. The attendance is growing for our Bibles, study views, which we thank God. So things are going But even if we weren't growing, the church might be exploding in growth in China right now. For example, you remember the saints recently, we taught a lesson in Pakistan and 2,000 people got baptized in Jesus' name from the video teaching that the Lord blessed us to be able to do in the middle of the night for us, middle of the, of the morning for them. And so the work of God, the Lord, is, the Lord is, is bringing people to him around the world. Right now, one of the greatest moves of God is in the Arab nations where all of that oh, yes. political hostility is going on. People are getting saved in droves over in those uh, Arab and Muslim nations. So the Lord is at work. So that's what we're talking to you about. Oh, we need you to get stirred up. Are you are you willing to be stirred up, dear viewer? Are you willing to get excited and get and become a part of the team? And, and a part of what we're teaching tonight, 
Don't just do your own thing. Be a, you have to help me. You've got to say amen when I say things like that. Tell me, tell me amen. Amen. <laughs> I'm serious about that. Because that's one of the spirits that's trying to really hinder the church right now. Is everybody doing their own thing. That's never going to work, precious saints of God. No, you know, in basketball, Bishop Marty, they call it being a ball hog. That means you want the ball all the time. You're going to shoot it every time you get it. You're never going to pass. You're not worried about rebounds. You're not playing any defense. You just want to score points so you can be outstanding. Everybody wear your t-shirt or whatever. But saints of God, we're one body. We're a body. And, and, and we're part of Shield of Faith Local. And then Shield of Faith is part of the fellowship. Then the fellowship is a part of the apostolic movement. Then the apostolic movement is a part of the Pentecostal movement. And it's one worldwide effort to get more people into heaven, which requires them coming through the church. So we got to grow the church. When I have a headache, we have to grow the church. When I don't have gas money, we have to grow the church. When I got relatives coming in from out of town, we've got to grow the church. Mm -hmm. We've got to stay focused with what Jesus is doing in the world. This is my appeal to you. Oh, we've talked about this before recently, but it's the issue of the hour. Because I've talked to pastors all over this country, and church after church, they're having a challenging time getting the body of Christ to come together in alignment and move forward in the things of God. So that's what we're talking about tonight. All right, let's go forward. I think we made the foundational concept clear. So Bishop Marty, let's talk about uh, what happened in the book of Acts. Would you read that portion, this title of our, this part of our lesson, it's talking about church growth in the book of Acts. All right, that's where the church started. When did it start? The day of Pentecost. Peter preached the first sermon. Peter made the first altar call. The same altar call we're making 2,000 years later. Peter didn't talk about a sinner's prayer and shaking the preacher's hand, giving God your heart. So, all right, read to us about the church in the book of Acts, Bishop Marty. By the direction of the Holy Ghost, the small band of 120 people won spiritual battles and carried out practical strategies until by the 4th century they had conquered the Roman Empire both spiritually and philosophically. Mm -hmm. From being killed and hated by prayer and evangelism, they developed from being initially, as I just stated, mm -hmm. hated and killed, to become the official religion of the Roman Empire correct, correct. and saw the pagan temples of Rome converted to become Christian churches. So we can I break in? It's because they grew. They started, you know, 12 people, then 120, then 3,000 more, then 5,000 more, right. then multiplication, then prevalence. The church moved forward like a mighty powerful force and challenged the paganism of Rome. Mm. All that demonic stuff that the Romans believed in, all those uh, gods that they worshipped and all the things that they did, horrible, terrible things that they did. And the church won. They started off being killed and hated and persecuted, but they kept praying, they kept fasting, they kept witnessing, they kept baptizing people, they kept telling the truth about Jesus Christ right. in adverse circumstances. And Bishop Marty, they won. By the year 322, 324, Constantine said Christianity it's is the official, official religion of the Roman religion. Empire. Right. We used to worship Jupiter and Mars and all that, but now we believe in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. To hear that, saints, Christianity conquered the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was much stronger than America is today in the world. And Christianity came in and won mm -hmm. and took over. They, they grew. And, and, and so the church has the capacity to triumph. Yeah. All right. Read on, the, yeah, go, read on the next one. Thank you, Mr. Mark. Read the next paragraph. The book of Acts shows the church developing and gaining spiritual momentum, mm -hmm. taking the message from Jerusalem mm -hmm. throughout all Asia Minor. All Asia Minor. And, and ending with the Apostle Paul preaching the word, excuse me, mm -hmm. preaching the word in the world's capital city. Rome. So what was the most important city in the world? At that time, Rome. It was Rome. And Paul, he, he went from, from little Jerusalem, which was a backwater, and he ended up preaching the gospel in, a, in like, would be like setting up a big brand new church in Paris and London and New York. I mean, the word was expanding. Mm -hmm. They had power. 
All right, go ahead, Bishop Margaret. In Acts, Luke shows the church continually progressing from addition, addition. as we said in Acts 2 and 47, to multiplication, right. as we talked about from Acts 6 and 7, mm -hmm. to prevalence mm -hmm. and dominion right. or dominance right. at Ephesus mm -hmm. in Acts 19 and 20. But, but they went through some things. What did they go through? Read about it. Along the way, there was dissension. Mm -hmm. yeah, some people left. Mm -hmm. Martyrdom. Right. Some people were beat up. Thank you. Demonic attacks. Right. And resistance by rulers and officials. Right. Yet the church grew as Jesus had promised. So they, so they went through a lot. Some were killed. Some got angry. There was dissension. There was conflict. The rulers hated them. They were arrested and beaten and so on and so on. But there was a power in the church to keep growing through all that adversity. All right, Mr. Marty, go ahead. In America today, there is a great spiritual resistance uh -huh. and many obstacles to the message of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But we are still destined to grow right. and make an eternal impact right. by the power of the Holy Ghost. Yes. No present social movement or cultural phenomenon are strong enough to stop the church of Jesus Christ from growing. So now we know that right now America is not a very spiritual place. We would be delusional if we were to try to say that it was. We know that we don't see enough people coming to church. You used to say the family that prays together stays together. We don't see enough people praying in their homes. We don't see enough fathers there with their children and intact families. And America is in a very dark place spiritually. Now we could just get discouraged and decide, well, I'm going to just go to heaven and just be happy to see Jesus. But that is not what God calls us to. The Lord calls us to stand up and do a great, great spiritual initiative and He's going to be with us. He's going to work with us. We were talking to a bishop and his wife today, and they said they believe they see revival coming to America, Bishop Marty. Thank they they testified to that just today. They said they see young people rising up, falling in love with Jesus. Look at what we just saw last week in Las Vegas. A place full of young people in love with Jesus, preaching the word. Those young men were preaching better than I can preach. I'm telling you, they had some serious church. So we can believe the Lord, saints of God. We're trying to build your faith. The just shall live by faith. The victory that overcomes the world is your faith. We've got to believe in what God is able to do. Now, my heart, those of you that know me and know Bishop Marty, you know, my heart is the church of God. And we weren't always like this. We were selfish little yuppies. We had two good jobs and a house on a hill and a Mercedes and kids in private school. And the Lord arrested us and put us in ministry. And it took over our lives. Wow. And now our lives are completely absorbed going around that we weren't doing that. We were just making good money, had a company car, an expense account. We were doing all right for ourselves. We could be very rich people by now. We I stayed know. in the same right. trajectory. But the Lord took over and put growing the kingdom as a center concern, the central passion of our lives. And so here we are. And we're trying to infect you with the same. You, you don't want to catch the COVID virus, but you want to catch the evangelism virus. I want to infect you with a passion. To do the work of God, it's an honorable thing. That's what we're talking about tonight. All right. Well, Bishop Murray, go ahead. Read on. God grows the church and populates heaven by using men and women. Correct. At Pentecost and at Caesarea, he used Simon Peter. Right. At Samaria, he used Philip. Mm -hmm. At Paphos, Lystra, Derby, Iconium. Ephesus and other places he used the Apostle Paul. Right. Now, in Rancho Cucamonga, he wants to use you. You get that now. That's a beautiful transition that you made. You went from the first century down to the 21st century. He, listen, folks, God's methods are men. When God does a work in the world, he says, I found David, a man I can use, a man of my own heart. He rejoiced to find David. He was glad to find Moses. He was glad to find Samuel. The Lord finds people. Oh, I wish I could preach right now. Mm. The Lord looks for people that will present their body a living sacrifice. There's nothing better you can do with your life. Don't give your life to laying up at the beach. 
Don't give your life to making money. Don't give your life to trying to see how many material things you can possess. Those things are all right. If God blesses you financially, good for you. I'm not hating on you. I'm glad you're doing well. But make sure that you've got the main thing as the main thing. And we used to sing a song, only what you do for Christ will last. Only what you do for him will be counted in the end. Mm -hmm. It's not going to make a bit of difference what car you drove when you get to heaven. You could have been in a Maybach, or you could have had a car that wouldn't start. It will not matter what clothes you wore, how many degrees you got from a major Ivy League university. Those things are good. I hope that those things happen to you. But don't say so, God. Don't ever let those things, those worldly ambitions, displace the passion. Satan offered Jesus all this stuff, Marty. We saw it in, I'm sorry, Bishop, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. in, in, in Matthew chapter 4, we saw Satan right. said, I can give you all the kingdoms of this world. Right. You've got to worship me. And Jesus said, yeah, it's not worth it. All that stuff is going to pass away. But the kingdom of God is eternal. And the things you do to serve God, you'll still be getting bonus checks a gazillion years from today. God will still be paying you for the times you worked in the altar room to tear with people. You cast out devils. You brought people to church in your car when you didn't feel like it. They had muddy feet, messed up your car, but you brought them anyway. Say, let's do something that really matters. I hope we're stirring you up. I'm trying as hard as I can. Stir up God's people. Because folks are dying in sin. And I just talked to somebody yesterday about their family. They had a bunch of cute little kids and grandkids. And all those kids are going to be here for the Antichrist if they don't get baptized in Jesus' name. And receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. They're cute little kids. They're blonde and they're cute and all that. But being cute is not going to get you into eternal life. Mm -hmm. You've got to be born again. I don't care if you graduated from Columbia and, and, and got a graduate degree from Yale uh, Divinity School. You've got to be saved. That's what this thing is about. So we're narrow-minded. Word of God said, straight is the way and narrow is the, uh, the, the, the way and narrow is the gate that leads to life. And few people are concerned about the right thing. Set your affection on things above and not the things of this world. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. So Bishop Marty, help us get the people stirred up. All right, go ahead. We were saying that Paul, he used Paul, he used Peter, and he used Philip, and now he's using you today in Rancho Cucamonga. Go ahead, Bishop Marty. The same Jesus who was building the church then is building his church today. Yeah. As we must deeply realize that we are central to the process of God's work in the world at this time. Right. We are doing nothing at all for church leaders right. whom we love mm -hmm. or for the success of our local congregation. Mm -hmm. A profound desire to honor Jesus Christ and to please him is the only possible acceptable motive for the ministry we offer to God. Mm -hmm. Our goal is to populate heaven, to labor that my house may be filled. And we find that scripture in Luke chapter 14, verse 23. Bishop Marty, I hope that our personalities never get in the way. I don't want anyone to ever think that they're doing something to please Bishop Marty. I'm ushering to please Apostle Alexander. And I'm going to work security to please my dear. Thank you for that. But that, but everything that we do, saints of God, let's do it. Because Jesus died on the cross and forgave us and covered us in. Let's do it for God. He's let's worth it. it. Because, if, you know, because if you're building the church for Bishop Marty, then when you get bad, mad at Bishop Marty, you're not going to build the church anymore. Because your motive wasn't ever as it should have been. Uh, you know, relationships come and go. People get mad at pastors. Can we be real about that? You know it as well as I do. I don't have to tell you because you know it. People get upset with leaders. But you can't ever get upset with the cause of Christ. If you don't make the pastor love the Lord. Mm. If you won't bring nobody to church because you don't care what the pastor thinks, well, bring somebody to church because Jesus is trying to save folks. Because of Jesus. Let's have our motive pure. Let's be consistent in our commitment. To the cause, it's not the cause of Alexander, God forbid. It's not the cause of Pentecostal Centers of the World, beautiful organization, God forbid. It's not the cause 
and of shield of faith, fellowship of churches. Those things are so superficial. Can we be honest like that? Yes. Yeah. This thing is not personality driven, saints. It's not about loving Bishop Ronnie Alexander or Bishop Payne or Bishop Rick Johnson. They're wonderful people. Wonderful people. It's not about loving Bishop Kelly Woods or, or doing it for um, somebody back in St. Louis. It's about Jesus Christ. What can we do to please the Lord? What is the Lord trying to do? He's not trying to build the stock market. He's trying to get people in heaven with him. And we can help him do that. All right, but we have to be about our father's business. Are we doing good? All right. If I have your approval, we'll go on. Let me read now. Here's some ingredients for church growth. So listen. Here's some things that have to be there for the church to grow. Now, the Lord wants this church to grow. In Tanzania, in Bolivia, in, in Afghanistan, the Lord wants this church to grow. But in every case, there's some things it takes. All right? In specific terms, there's several things which are required for God's church to grow. And included in that list are vision, number one, faith, number two, unity, number three, and hard work, number four. Now, there's more than that, but we focus on these four things. I want to bring them to your Holy Ghost attention. We need vision, we need faith, we need unity, and we need hard work. That will always be necessary. If the church, that's what the early church had. That's what the church had when I was a little boy when I got baptized. And that's what the church needs today in the age of TikTok and, and Instagram and, and a computer, everything is digital, and, and, but it still takes the same things. So let's talk about those four things. In any church which will grow, the pastor leader must first share a vision with the church that comes from God. The leader has to have a God-given vision. We are giving you vision tonight. And what we're giving you tonight is God said it's time to focus on growing my church. That's what time it is. That's a statement of vision. Now, there's specifics to the vision, all right? There's the Day of Giving. There's the Yaya uh, Convention. Uh, there are different things. There's a Women's Con. There are things we do to take us where the Lord wants to take us and growing the church, all right? But it starts with vision number one. Number two, then you as the people of God, you must have faith in the vision. You must trust that the pastor has a word from the Lord. Okay, let's do this. All right, right now, the pastor says, we're all going to help the young people over in Las Vegas. Let's do that. All right, pastor says, right now, it's time for us to bring our money in and build up the financial resources. Let's do that. All right, now it's time for the women to be strong, to, to, to take care of the women and keep them encouraged and keep them on fire for God. Don't let them get depressed and so forth. So let's do that. So whatever the vision is, whether it's a short-term, medium-range, or long-term vision, the biggest part of our vision right now is build this building at 70 a Archibald Avenue. We're going to get in there. We've got plans. We've got contractors. We've got the money in place. And we're going to build us a church. And then we're going to fill that church up and have two or three services on the weekend. Now, that's the vision. Amen. Now, we got to believe in the vision. Believe in And then when we get through, we've got to work for the vision. Yes, yes. We've got to have unity. All right. So, so, so I hope this is making sense to you. I think it is. So, number one, it must be vision. Number two... There must be faith in the vision. Now, we talk in these notes somewhere about at Kadesh Barnea, the people of God did not have faith in the vision. Bishop Marty, Moses had a vision. Moses said, it was given by God. Moses didn't make that vision, huh? Mm -hmm. The Lord gave him that vision. The Lord said, you're going to take these three million Jews into a land that flows in the ground. You're going to put them in houses they didn't build. You're going to let them eat off of trees they didn't plant and drink wine out of vineyards that they didn't cultivate. I'm going to do this for you. So Moses said, I got a vision. What Dr. King said, what? I have a dream. Moses had a dream. He took the dream to the people. The people said, no. We don't believe in that vision. You've lost your mind, Moses. Don't you know that the people over there are tall and so forth? They refuse. Here, are y'all hearing me teach tonight? Are y'all hearing Bishop Marty? That's, it starts with a vision from a leader who hears from God. I know I hear from God. Bishop Marty, I know. In 1981, in March, it was me and you and your brother and our kids sitting in here. And here we are later with churches all over the planet mm -hmm. and, 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 and people all over the world getting baptized in Jesus' name, all in, in Tanzania in a city called Bea. 500 people got the Holy Ghost one evening, and about 400 of them got baptized in Jesus' name. See, but, but it started with just a thought. 
God said, go and open a church, and I'm going to do some things. So the Lord, Moses brought a vision to the, to the people of Kadesh Barnea. They said, go in and see the land, because God's getting ready to give it to us. And the people came back, and they said to Moses, Moses, we don't believe in the vision. Yes, you fed us with manna out of the sky. You gave water out of a rock, and you led us through the Red Sea. But we don't believe in the vision. And they rebelled against the vision. And, and, and when people rebel against the vision, everything stops. All is lost. All is lost. All it took for that vision, for that enterprise to die, is a lack of faith right. on the part of the people. If the people had believed, they would have risen up in unity and said, Moses, we don't know how we're going in there, but we believe in God. We believe in you. So we're going to take this land. They could have gone right into that land. Mm -hmm. But instead, they died because of unbelief, lack of unity. And then, of course, if they don't have any unity, of course they're not going to put in the work. But when we come to talk about 7080 Archibald Avenue, the Lord blessed Pastor Darren to find that building. I didn't find it. Just Pastor Darren found it. The Lord used Pastor Darren. And the Lord provided everything. Put all the stars in alignment, and that there were four people that wanted to buy it, and they chose our church to buy it. They, they wanted to sell it to us. There were other churches that wanted to buy it. They, they sold it to us, and then the, the money people got right in line and said, here's the money to buy it, and here's the money to fix it. All that's in place. So the Lord put us in a position, but we've got to embrace it, and we've got to put in the work. And so that's what we're saying. I hope this is making sense. If any of those components is missing, if the vision is missing, the faith is missing, the unity is missing, or the work is missing, then you won't have success. So, Shield of Faith, I'm asking you openly, right here on Tuesday Night Bible said, are we unified? Or, as saints of God, are we together on what we are doing right now? Are we together? Did we come together? Oh, we came together on that men's conference, and I had a room full of men, praising God. People came in and all kinds of things. We were together on Yaya, and now we're getting together on the Sunday school class that's going to start in a few weeks, and we're getting together on the women's conference. And we're getting together, whatever, and we're moving step by step. All right, so that's what makes the church grow. Now, listen, look at the next paragraph in your notes. Mr. Marty, would you read the next paragraph? When God gives vision, he will also give strategy to leadership, showing the leader how the vision can come to pass. Now, moment back, can I ask you to read that important sentence again, make sure the saints get it? Sure. When God gives vision, he will also give strategy Correct. to the leadership, right. showing the leader how the vision can come to pass. Right. God is very practical. Mm -hmm. At Kadesh Barnea, the people did not wait to receive the strategy God, no doubt, would have given to Moses. Absolutely. They immediately rebelled at the very vision itself. Perhaps they assumed that there was no strategy which could bring that vision to pass. They had no faith, Bishop Marty. Do you want to comment on them or shall I? You go on. They, they, the people had no faith. They, they, they had a promise from God. God who cannot lie. God who cannot lie. They had a promise from God. They had a great, anointed, gifted leader. And God was going to tell Moses how to do it. He told Joshua how to get into Jericho. He said, just walk around each day and then shout on the seventh day around seven times. And you're going to go in. He told Moses how to get through the Red Sea. There's a great big sea there. Lift out your rod. Put it over the sea. I'm going to make the water go back. Then y'all going to walk through. So the Lord was going to tell Moses what to do. Oh, I wish I could preach it. The Lord was going to show Moses just what to do to take that land. God had a plan. People sometimes say, you know, uh, the, 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 the enemy has something he's trying to do. Well, the enemy has a plan for God. But God has a plan for your life. God has a plan for your success. God has a plan to see what he wants for you to become your reality. God has a plan for you to receive your full reward. Not, not a partial reward. Not let the devil rob you and discourage you and misdirect you. But the people, they did not even wait for Moses to tell them what the strategy was. We don't really have no idea what it would have been. The, I've often said this, Bishop Marty, the Lord could have just sent a plague through there, sent COVID through there, and wiped out all the people in Canaan. And the children of Israel walked right in. What did he do with Jehoshaphat? 
He said, here's the strategy. Go out there and praise me. Yes. <laughs> they, went, they got tambourines and harps and went out and praised God. And the Lord turned the enemy on each other. They killed each other and walked out and picked up three days worth of spoils. God had a plan. Listen to me. God has a plan for your success. Don't be scared. Don't cry. Don't be discouraged. God has a plan for you. All right? You don't know what it is, but he'll show you in time. And for a church to grow, God has to lead. All right, let's go to the next uh, portion. Go ahead. You know, you come Apostle, when, when we look at this and we see the reaction of the children of Israel at Kadesh Barnea, and then we say to ourselves, how, how could they have done that? I mean, that mm -hmm. doesn't make sense. They saw the miracles that God did, and he put man out every morning mm -hmm. for them, and and he made raw water come out of a rock, and I just don't understand. How, how is it that the children of Israel did not believe God, and yet in our very life, we come to a place where we have to make a decision, and we forget the miracles that God right. has done in our That's life, right. the prayers that he's answered, right. the miracles that he's done, the That's healings right. that we realize, the, 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 the financial blessings, uh, how he, he caused the IRS to just obliterate a huge bill. How he caused uh, the bank account to just forgive something. I mean, it's just crazy stuff. Yeah. And yet we do the same thing that the children of Israel did. Yeah. We have to look at our lives and we have to, as the song says, mm. count our blessings. Right. Count them. And, and then you'll see what God has done in your life. <laughs> David said to King uh, Saul said, the Lord that delivered me from the lion and the bear, he's, he's going to deliver me from the He's the same right. God, and he's going to do it right, again. Right, yeah. right. All right, let's go forward. Now, uh, so let's talk about spiritual unity, dear precious saints. I know you're with us, so let's talk about spiritual unity. Uh, Bishop Marty, would you read about spiritual unity as we go forward to grow the church? What spiritual unity looks like. Right, how does it look? All right. Unity among believers is much more than simply loving one another and maintaining joyful relationships. So that is unity, but there's more to unity than that. Sure. Spiritual unity means working together to build the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Scripture shows us this concept in a number of places. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians chapter 12 shows us how we are called to work together right. as one spiritual body. One has one gift, and another has another gift. And you use your gift, and I'll use my gift, and somehow this church is going to be built. But we have to work together, though. Yes. We cannot all have a vision. And that's one of the things that COVID did. It put everybody in their home, and a whole lot of folks all over the country, not just here in Southern California, people started, all kind of ministers started doing things and starting this and starting that. And when there's no cohesion, the best ball team is not going to win when they don't have one cohesion. I'm telling you, we must work together. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says we're just one body. How in the world can my feet go to, to the restaurant and my hands don't go? It's not going to work. It's crazy. And, and when my head sleeps, the whole body sleeps with it. And so that metaphor of a body is powerful. We should might take us further. What about Ephesians chapter 4? It shows us unified church leadership divided by giftings in apostleship, mm -hmm. prophecy, mm -hmm. evangelism, mm -hmm. pastoring, and teaching. Right. While each is separately gifted, yet unity is the only quality which allows the saints to receive full benefits from the gift of each individual. So if in a church you've got an apostle, you've got an evangelist, you've got a prophet, you've got a pastor and a teacher or some teachers, if they don't work together, the church doesn't get the benefit of all that God placed there at that church's disposal. In every church there should be an apostolic leader, there should be some prophets, there should be some evangelists, some pastors and some teachers. If there's no evangelists, the church is not going to, is not going to grow. If there's no prophets, then the people are not going to be in tune with a lot of what God is doing. If there's no apostle, there's not going to be order. If there's no pastor, the people are not going to be cared for. If there's no teacher, the people are going to be ignorant. We need all of that 
That is how the church grows. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfection of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith. So that's what spiritual unity look like, looks like. It's individuals with specific different callings working together. Not irritated about our differences. Well, you know, you can't do this, but I can. And I don't see why you're doing that. Well, because they have their own gifting. But together, we are better. Together, we please God. Take us further. What about Mark 13, 34? It shows us that each and every person in the body has at least one gift, mm -hmm. and perhaps even more. Right. Which they are commanded to use right. for the benefit of the kingdom and for the benefit of others in the church. Right. Every man or every person right. has his own work. So here's what Jesus said in Mark 13, 34. The Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house, gave authority to his servants, to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch, commanded the pastor to supervise the, the joint unified effort of every saint. So every saint in the church has his or her assignment. Every saint in the church has their own individual gifting. As Bishop Mike said, maybe one or more gifts. But there's not a person that has a gift of the Holy Ghost that doesn't have some sort of spiritual gift. And that's just a fact. And the Lord expects us to take all those gifts and use them together. And saints of God, when we do that, the churches will grow. I'm telling you, there's no way when we get everybody using their gift and doing what God gifted them to do. Oh, somebody's got an evangelist gift will bring 15 people to get saved. And somebody's got a pastoral gift will take care of their needs and make sure they're happy. Somebody's got a teaching gift will instruct them so they get to learn their Bible and know the things of God and on and on and on. All right. Unity. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Um, Bishop Marty, we come down to our last page. This may be in some senses almost the most important page. Let me read that paragraph if I can, and then we'll go talk about it. Over and over in the Old Testament, uh, it describes in excruciating detail the division of labor, the division of responsibilities, and the cooperative efforts of all the people of God, causing the Old Testament saints to receive God's best. We read, now I talked about this this morning on the prayer line. Many times when, when we're reading through our Bible, we'll have a long list, a whole chapter full of names. And I'll just get to reading all these names, trying to read all these Hebrew names. And, and you're listening and you're getting bored and you say, I don't understand. I don't know why in the world God has putting us through all these names. But God is showing us that everybody matters in their place. Every, we put some in it, the porters the Nethanims, the warriors, the treasurers, the priests, the Levites, the administrators, all of it matters. Every one of God's people matters. And the Lord wrote down all those things. When, when Ezra and Nehemiah and them started rebuilding the walls, they put down who built the fish gate and who built over here and who labored over here. And they, and they give everybody credit for what they did. And why does the Lord give us all that, Bishop Marty? Because he wants us to understand that the body of Christ is a unified activity. It is a collective effort. Mm -hmm. It is something that we do together. Mm -hmm. All right. So here we are under David, under Moses, under Solomon, under Ezra, under Nehemiah. We're given an almost endless list of names and responsibilities because this kind of cooperation is important to God. Because he gives each person their gifting. Because he will pass out eternal rewards for services rendered. The Old Testament gives us long list of every person that works as a Levite. And I know some of y'all on the prayer line, you just get, I imagine you just get straight up irritated with the Apostle Alexander. Why is he reading all those names? I don't understand all these names. I don't know these people. But the Lord put those names in there. 
And the saints of the Lord is serious about his Bible. He takes his Bible seriously. And you know the Lord respects his Bible? He respects every name he put in there. All those chronologies in the book of Chronicles, all of those tribes, 182 from the tribe of Judah, 373 from the tribe of Levi, you know, 499 from the tribe of Issachar, on and on and on. God put all that in there because we are laborers together, Bishop Marty. We are working together. Saints of God, the Lord needs you. Shield of Faith Ranch of Cucamonga needs you. The Shield of Faith Fellowship of Churches needs you. The body of Christ needs you. And I'm talking about you, not your neighbor, but you. This is how the church grows. When every person realizes that Paul said no member of the body is to be disrespected. Mm. He said every member is needful. Mm -hmm. Every organ in your body, you need however many organs there are. You need it. And you can't back to be maximized without it. That's what this lesson is tonight. We've got to get this across to you. You've got to see how much we need you to be in your place, doing your job, growing the kingdom by the gifts that you have. You are important. And maybe the internet try to tell people they're unimportant, Bishop Marty. Do you think the devil ever says that to some people? Oh, I'm sure of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of his strategies. All right? The interminable list that the Lord placed in the Old Testament scriptures are included to memorialize those who worked, who served, who built, who fought. The inclusion of those names shows us that God is keenly aware of the complexity required to promote God's agenda in the world. I'll put this in italics here, saints. A church is a complex, complicated, multifaceted organism and will succeed only to the extent that the members of the church are engaged in serving based on their giftedness and serving with unity and accountability. A church is very complicated. So you got ushers, you've got greeters, you've got deacons, you've got singers, you've got musicians, you've got intercessors, you've got youth leaders, children's leaders, Sunday school leaders, you've got preachers, you've got baptizers, you've got altar room workers, and on and on and on. We could go on and on and on far more than that. You've got all the small groups that are doing this and doing that. You've got the office workers, you've got the executive pastor, you've got the office manager, um, you've got the, the team ministry, uh, and on and on and on. The church, listen, a church is very complicated. It isn't enough for you to just come and sit and enjoy the Word of God. It's wonderful that you're saved. It's wonderful that you're living holy. That's not enough. The church is not going to grow just because you are saved and living holy and you come and sit and, and thank God for your salvation. Thank God you're delivered from sin. But to grow the church, every man has to have his own activity going on. I think you listening tonight I imagine probably 90% of you have a real good assignment already in the kingdom of God, and you're doing it. I want to appreciate you. I want to inspire you. I want to challenge you to be as productive as you can. I want you to bring other people and get them busy building the kingdom. It's all God is doing. And he's not going to let us off this planet to live by the same. Mm. It's only when the last person that is ordained for salvation, gets baptized in Jesus' name, and filled with the Holy Ghost, then the trumpet's going to sound. Right. And the scripture says that the Lord is, it, it has long patience waiting for the, the, the crop to ripen. He really wants us. You hear me? The Lord really wants you up there with Him. You're His bride. He's excited about you. But He's not going to bring us up there until the last person is saved. We've got to be about our Father's business. That's what this message is about tonight. So Bishop Marty, give us the last paragraph. So, the last paragraph says, what's in it for me? I heard your apostle asking me to get busy and grow God's kingdom and, and do stuff and all that and tithe and work and pray and witness. And, but what's in it for me? So Bishop Martin, let's talk about that. What a tremendous eternal joy will come to every person who labored for Jesus in this life, helping to build his church. Uh -huh. Some will get 
there and find little reward, mm -hmm. meaning they'll get to heaven, right. and there won't be much of a reward because they have rendered little sacrificial service to God. Revelation 14 and 13 says, of those who serve sacrificially in this world and their works do follow them. Show the faith even in these difficult days, we are going to grow the church, expand the kingdom, and win many souls to eternal salvation. Our church is entering into a season of productivity and joy. Yes. yes, most churches have suffered in recent times, but we will see God's favor in tremendous ways in days to come because we will operate with unity, accountability, respect for pastoral leadership, cooperation, and enthusiastic and sacrificial service. God will respond by releasing his anointing in great measure, which will produce great kingdom results. So now, listen, saints, let's take this seriously. Jesus told them when they came back and found him at the temple, he asked them, said, didn't you know that I must be, must be. about my father's business? Listen, we cannot, we cannot trivialize this, um, this mandate that God has placed on us to represent him in the world. We are ambassadors for Christ. If we don't tell them, they won't know. We are a royal priesthood. We're a chosen nation of peculiar people. God called us out to use us for his glory. We are laborers with God. And we're going to do what it takes to grow the kingdom. We're not going to let discouragement stop us. We're not going to let carnality stop us. We're not going to let opposition. We are not going to let opposition stop us. We're not going to let skeptics and haters. We've been reading in Nehemiah and on the prayer line, there's Samuelet and Tobiah. And they hated the fact that the Jews were building God's house. Oh, how those demons in them hated the fact that we're rebuilding the city, rebuilding the wall, rebuilding the house of God, reinstituting worship, re-honoring the Sabbath, clarifying who the priests are, bringing in the tithes. We've done all that sort of thing. And San Valen and Tobiah did everything they could think of to try to stop. They said, come on down, we just want to talk to you. Another place they were trying to kill Ezra and Nehemiah and them. They talked about, they said, if a fox walked on that wall, y'all building that old ugly looking wall. If a fox walked on that wall, you know, uh, that wall, well, it's so weak, but y'all building ain't nothing. There ain't nothing to that. And, and it's illegal. We're going to tell the king we're gonna, and make him stop. And oh, how the devil fought. Jesus said, the gates of hell, Sandal and Tobiah, were the gatekeepers. And I'm telling you, the gates of hell are always in operation. The devil's up all night. He doesn't get sleep. He doesn't get tired either. The Lord never sleeps and never slumbers, and the devil works all night. And I'm telling you, there's always opposition. We know that. We're not children. We're not ignorant of devices. But greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And we're on the winning side. And I've given my life to this. Uh, you know, and I'm not going to at this point my life. I'm not going to collapse and go out and start doing something else coming. I've given my life to this. And many of you have as well. I commend you. I encourage you. Paul said, you at Thessalonica, you love one another, but I exhort you that you would abound more and more. I, I think you should work harder and harder, be more and more focused, be more and more sincere, because time is very short, and the Lord can come any minute, you know that. All you have to do is look at the, at the news every day and see another somebody shooting people for no reason, all the things that are going on, all the immorality. And so it's time to be about our Father's business. The end of all things is at hand, says Peter, be sober, watch unto prayer. What a good lesson this is tonight. This was the Lord speaking to us. And Bishop Murray, you and I have faithfully discharged the word of God to the people of God. I want to thank you for being a part. I want to thank you for coming. You didn't have to do it. There's a lot of people that don't tune in to the, to the Bible class. But thank you for being one. We honor you. Thank you for bringing others to it. Please share it. When we go off, you can share it to your friends. You can post it to your story or whatever. And it'll go all over Facebook. And others can see the Lord talking about growing the church. If there's anyone not saved, we always mention salvation and we make an altar call so that you can be born again. We have several that are coming on this Sunday to be baptized in Jesus' name. We believe God's going to give them the Holy Ghost. We're excited about it. But we would that everybody 
to take advantage of the opportunity to be saved. Now remember our announcements this Saturday night. We're going to go and fellowship. Those that want to be a part of the Fine Arts uh, small group, we're going to be going to Claremont College and have a wonderful time uh, and see a play. If you'd like to be a part, call the church office. We'll tell you how you can be a part on Saturday night. And then also remember the day of giving, Bishop Marty, that is on August the 7th, first Sunday in August. We're going to bring money because we set our affection to the house of God. We love shield of faith. Most of all, we love Jesus. So we're going to bring money to the house of God and make sure that the church is financially strong. That's what August said. One of the captains will be contacting you. But if nobody does contact you, you can contact me and Bishop Marty. We on our team because we're going to raise many thousands of dollars for the house of God. Well, the Lord bless you, Bishop Marty. Is there any other announcement? We should talk about Sunday school, maybe. Is that true? Why don't you do that? Starting the very first Sunday in August, we are going to institute Sunday school. So at 11.45, mm -hmm. right there in the location where we're worshiping, we're going to be in one of the classrooms. And uh, we'll, the first class is at the first, actually the first month mm -hmm. of August. For four weeks, we're going to be looking at uh, the study of end times, otherwise known as eschatology. Mm -hmm. And um, some important things to say. You, I think you'll find it fascinating. So come and be a part. There will be refreshments for you. Something uh, good to drink and something good to eat while you're sitting and listening to the Word taught. So we look to see you then. Ms. Moore is a very gifted teacher. She's going to be teaching those four weeks of lessons from the month of August. Then in September, Dr. Keith Fisher, Pastor Keith Fisher, will be teaching an honor uh, Classes for children will be available at the very same time. Those of you who have children, if you want to come and receive the excellent teaching from Bishop Marty, as I'm going to do, I'll be there every week in your class, enjoying the revelation God gives you. And then if you want to come be a part of that class, the food will be there, but also we'll take care of your children. We'll minister to them while Bishop Marty is ministering to you. The Lord bless you. Please give tonight. Don't wait for the day of giving. As soon as this class is over, I'm going to get my phone and do my giving into the Shield of Faith account. So please tithe and please uh, offer. Now, we had a miracle as I close. One of our brothers is in the hospital with a very grave uh, condition. And Minister Mary Matkin and some of the other wise ones, the beautiful sisters, uh, went to the hospital and prayed with him. And the Lord gave him the Holy Ghost. And then, uh, knowing about his condition, but hear this now. These wonderful sisters went to dinner after they ministered the Holy Ghost to this man. They sat down in a restaurant, and a man they'd never met walked up to their table and said, I just want to give you my testimony. He said, I had the condition. He described the exact same condition that our brother is dealing with. He said, it was about, I guess it was when I was 37 years old, now I'm 81, so it's been 40-something years ago. The doctor said I would die within a year or two. And the Lord healed me from that condition. And here I am, 81 years old, an apostolic believer. They had never met this man, Mr. Marty. And he talked to them for about 15 minutes and told them the wonders of what God had done in a miraculous healing of the same condition that our brother is dealing with. So we believe the Lord that God is going to give us a miracle. God is a miracle working God. Come to church, let us pray for you, and receive a miracle from God. God bless you, that's our whole lesson for tonight. God bless you, and we're going to shut down our camera, and we look forward to seeing you on the prayer line tomorrow. Oh, wait, oh, wait, oh, wait. Wasn't that powerful? I told you it was going to be good. We're so thrilled that you can join us for this powerful lesson, this rich word study. Oh, we know that the Lord has asked us to study, to show ourselves approved unto God. And he's also asked us to prepare ourselves to give an answer to every man that asks of the hope that lies in us. I'm sure you're ready to do just that. Amen. We're here every Wednesday night at 730. So we want to welcome you to come back every week. And hey, next time, bring somebody with you. We're reminding you that we do have service 
every Sunday at 1 p.m. That's right, you get to have a time in the morning and get some breakfast and then join us for our powerful worship service. We are meeting in the Emmanuel Praise Sanctuary at 9592 7th Street in the city of Rancho Cucamonga. Won't you come down and join us? Oh my goodness, we would love to have you. Thank you so much for joining and we look forward to seeing you again in our Bible study time. God bless.